Welcome to part three of lecture 14 of aerospace propulsion. So we left off uh, with this question of how would this parameter look different if the nozzle was unchoked? Well, we'd, have, we'd be able to get rid of that dependence on the atmospheric pressure, right? Because we know that the nozzle exit pressure is equal to the ambient pressure. So simply the gross thrust is m dot air times v19. So the parameter becomes much more simply just fg over d squared v02. Now let's look at some actual engine data to try to uh, see how some of these parameters are related. So we have uh, on our vertical axis here specific fuel consumption, and then on the horizontal axis we have net thrust, and then we've got two plots. So one is um, the sort of, we've got curves of Mach number, and that's on both plots actually. And then we've got the sort of closer to vertical lines on the top plot are T naught four values, and in the bottom plot are um, high pressure shaft rotational speed in RPM. Um, and what we can see very obviously is that the turbine inlet temperature and the HP shaft rotational speed are essentially able to function as surrogates for one another because the plots look almost identical. Um, so lines of constant values of uh, T naught four and of constant uh, N H are parallel to one another. Um, so that's useful because it tells us that we don't really need to sort of track these things separately. If we know one, we effectively can know the other. Now, in industry, the actual parameters used are not always truly non-dimensional. Um, this is typically done because comparisons are most often made for the same engine operating at different conditions rather than different engines. Um, and so the big thing that tends to be dropped is anything that has to do with geometry, such as the engine size. So that means that our air mass flow group would become something like m dot air over the square root of p naught two p naught two. That would have some kind of crazy units. So instead, what is typically done is you get the mass flow rate times the square root of theta over delta, where these are non-dimensional stagnation temperature and stagnation pressure ratios. And we introduced those conceptually back in Aero Fundamentals. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. For the fuel mass flow group, you'd have m dot f over square root p naught two p naught two. And for rotational speed, we get something where we take the n, the, the, the rotational speed over the square root of p naught two, since that's how the Mach numbers scale. Um, and change that into an n over square root of theta, where this theta is the same thing here. It's a non-dimensional to, uh, total temperature ratio. Right, so theta is T naught two over a reference value. Usually the reference value for temperature is 288K. Um, for delta, it's P naught, um, in the pre case we looked at there, it's usually uh, P naught two. So um, P naught two over P naught two ref, usually that's one atmosphere. So this means that these forms have the same units as the base quantity. So um, you know, the corrected mass flow has units of mass flow rate. The corrected uh, speed has units of rotational speed. Nevertheless, these quantities scale appropriately with changes in inlet stagnation pressure or temperature. So let's apply this to performance scaling when flying with one less engine on a two engine air, uh, commercial aircraft. So commercial aircraft have to be able to fly safely if one of the engine fails during flight. So we've already discussed the impact of this during takeoff. Um, a further detail associated with this is that you have to be able to fly without altering the throttles. So that if uh, you've got two engines in operation going down the runway and everything works fine, your takeoff distance is much shorter and the climb rate is higher than it strictly needs to be. If while you're in the middle of that takeoff roll an engine fails, literally all that happens is you have to just deflect the rudder to um, counteract the uh, now um, you know, non-canceled out torques from, from, from the one motor. Um, but, and then you're just gonna take a longer to accelerate uh, to get to your takeoff speed um, and your climb rate will be less, but you'll, you'll, you won't have to change anything else. The same idea applies during cruise when the bypass nozzle is choked. So we can use a dimensional analysis approach that we've introduced today to estimate the changes in the engine and the aircraft performance if we lose thrust from one engine. So the thrust from the core and the bypass are both strongly affected by P naught two. 
right? And this is affected by both altitude and flight Mach number. And we can trade these off. When we fly lower, that means we have higher pressure. So if we want P02 to be constant, we'd have to reduce the Mach number. So the requirements of an engine or loss are that we still have to have sufficient range to get to an airport for landing. We have to be able to fly high enough to get over any mountains between our current position and that closest airport. So this is actually pretty challenging for two engine aircraft, um, like our new efficient aircraft we're, design we, we're designing engines for, which only has two engines. If one's lost, then basically you need to have one of the engines produce two times as much thrust. We s can't simply raise the turbine inlet temperature to double the thrust. The engine life would be sort of dramatically shortened and would probably only last a few minutes. Um, so instead, we can use an approximate analysis here um, and we treat this by assuming that the functioning engine is maintained at exactly the same non-dimensional condition as before loss of the other engine. Basically, we have to fly lower and slower when one engine is lost. So this entails a small increase in turbine inlet temperature because the atmospheric temperature has gone up. Um, but the higher air density lets the aircraft fly, fly slower. And the engine increases net thrust through a combination of higher air density and lower forward speed. We always want to fly at the CL that gives us our maximum velocity times L over D, as we discussed earlier in the course. And we can show that for this to be true, the product of atmospheric uh, pressure and Mach number squared should be a constant. And we can actually see this relationship here um, versus altitude on this plot. Um, so this is uh, flight velocity ratio for constant CL. So this assumes that we're initially cruising at 35,000 feet. Um, when we lose thrust from one engine, so the normalized thrust here is one from, from an engine. Uh, and then we're only considering the thrust from the bypass of the new efficient aircraft engines, but that's more than 90% of the total thrust, and it's a good approximation. The curve is sort of what shows the scaling of the thrust uh, based on uh, that assumption, whereas the black uh, Xs show a more detailed modeling approach using a full engine simulation, and they're basically on top of each other. And what we see is that if we want to sort of say, well, how much more thrust do we need? We need two times as much thrust. Tells us how far we have to move up this black curve. And then we can come straight down from there to find the altitude at which we have to be able to fly um, in order to, to achieve that. Right, so we need to double our design thrust means our aircraft has to descend from 35,000 feet to about 19,000 feet. That is not high enough to get over lots of mountain ranges. Um, so the height of Mount Everest in the Himalayas, for example, is just over 29,000 feet. So this means that flight route planning for twin engine aircraft actually have to account for the height of the terrain and make sure that in the case that an engine's lost, you're not sort of stranded with mountains in the way between you and an airport that you can safely get to. You also have to fly slower. The flight speed is reduced from about 231 meters a second when we were at cruise uh, altitude to about 173 meters a second. This approach assumes, again, that the non-dimensional conditions remain exactly constant. So because our bypass nozzle choke, there's only one independent parameter governing the behavior of the engine, and that's P04 over P02, so we're keeping that the same. That means the output parameters then um, both the one involving thrust and the one involving uh, the flow rate of air, th those have to be the same. So we need to double our net thrust. So the calculation procedure is actually pretty non-trivial. It's iterative, but we know how to vary P0 2 with PA um, since PA times M squared has to be a constant. So that helps. Um, but uh, to going back, obtaining this, this plot is actually a non-trivial amount of, uh, of effort. Of course, a computer code can do it easily. We can also look at the our dimensional analysis to tell us what happens to the range of the aircraft when we uh, change to this single engine operation. So we can look at our fuel burn parameter um, for flight at 35,000 feet versus flight at 19,000 feet. So here, um, the subscript 1, 9, and 35 re re refer to the different altitudes. And we uh, are maintaining our constant turbine inlet to compressor inlet temperature ratio. So then in that case, um, M.F, uh, the, the fuel rate ratio is related to the stagnation pressure ratio and the square root 
of the uh, total temperature ratios. And so we can compute this ratio, and knowing our thrust ratio, the variation in the specific fuel consumption could be determined. Though the fuel flow um, actually uh, increases, but the thrust goes up more, so the specific fuel consumption actually goes down. But the range varies with the velocity divided by the specific fuel consumption, and it turns out the drop in velocity is bigger than the drop in SFC, so the range goes down. Okay, so that's the end of what we can do with this simple dimensional analysis. Um, now, in the following lecture, we'll move on to start designing the turbo machinery in our engine.